<laughs> the inspiration for I Love My People came from Dr. Burroughs' poem, What Shall I Tell My Children Who Are Black? What shall I tell my children who are black of what it means to be captive in this dark skin? What shall I tell my dear ones, fruit of my womb, of how beautiful they are when everywhere they turn they are faced with aberrants of everything that is black. The night is black, and so is the boogeyman. Villains are black, with black hearts. A black cow gives no milk. A black hen lays no eggs. Bad news comes bordered in black. Morning clothes black, storm clouds black. Black, black is evil. And evil is black, and devil's food is black. What shall I tell my dear ones raised in a white world, a place where white has been made to represent all that is good and pure and fine and decent, where clouds are white and dolls, and heaven surely is a white place with angels robed in white and cotton candy and ice cream milk and ruffled Sunday dresses and dream houses and long sleek Cadillacs and angels food is white, all, all white. What can I say therefore when my child comes home in tears because a playmate has called him black, big lipped, flat nosed and nappy headed? What will he think when I dry his tears and whisper, yes, that's true but no less beautiful and dear. How shall I lift up his head, get him to square his shoulders, look his adversaries in the eye, confident in the knowledge of his worth, serene under his sable skin and proud of his own beauty? What can I do to give him strength that he may come through life's adversities as a whole human being, unwarped, and human in a world of biased laws and inhuman practices that he might survive. And survive he must. For who knows, perhaps this black child here bears the genius to discover the cure for cancer or to chart the course of exploration of the universe. So he must survive for the good of all humanity. He must and will survive. I have drunk deeply of late from the fountain of my black culture, sat at the knee of and learned from Mother Africa, discovered the truth of my heritage, the truth so often obscured and omitted, and I find I have much to say to my black children. I will lift up their heads in proud blackness with the story of their fathers and their fathers' fathers, and I shall take them into a way back time of kings and queens who ruled the Nile and measured the stars and discovered the laws of mathematics upon whose backs have been built the wealth of three continents. I will tell him this and more, and his heritage shall be his weapon and his armor. It will make him strong enough to win any battle he may face. Since this story is oft obscured, I must sacrifice to find it for my children, even as I must sacrifice to feed and clothe and shelter them. So this I will do for them if I love them. None will do it for me, 
I must find the truth, the heritage for myself and pass it on to them. In the years to come, I believe because I have armed them with the truth, my children and their children's children will venerate me. For it is the truth that will make us free. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yes. <laughs> I love my people. <laughs> I love them too. <laughs> The question was asked, what do we, what shall we tell our children? And in the answer to that, in a workshop with children across the city, we were able to use poetry and storytelling. And in that created an answer, the answer called, I love my children. In this song, it, it shares a lyric, says, my people are strong from the cradle to the grave. They couldn't break us down, even when they called us slaves. We kept our pride throughout the years, worked hard and prayed, even shed some tears. No matter what the world has put us through, we've come out on top in everything we do. I love my people. And we can hear the children as their voices begin to chant because the chant is spread across the country. My people are strong from the cradle to the grave. They couldn't break us down even when they called us slaves. We kept our pride throughout the years. Work hard and prayed, even shed some tears. No matter what the world has put us through, we come out on top in everything we do. Everything we do. Y'all say it with me. I love my people. I love my people. So say it again. I love my people. I love my people. I love my people, all the colors of our skin. If we all work together, we know that we can win. I love the way we walk. I love the way we talk. And I love the way we sing. I'm blessed because I know one thing. I'm going to love my people and there is no doubt. We're going to be all right is what I'm talking about. Won't you say it with me? We'll say it again. I love my people. I love my people. You find my people all around the world. Man and woman, boy and girl. Always try to do our best. We work hard every day and seldom rest. <laughs> if I could have one wish come true. Then you'd love me like I love you. And spread it. Everybody say, I love my people. I love my people. Oh, say it again. I love my people. I love my You see, no matter where we go, there we are. We're not just players with the shining stars. Spread this word both near and far about just how blessed we truly are, y'all. Take these words across the land. Divided we fall, united we stand. Think about your greatness and your history. Without my people, where would we be? Tell me. You see, we are those people who we've been waiting for. We are the ones, the inventor of the filament for the light bulb, the doorknob, the broom, the dresser drawer, the folding bed. We're the ones that invented that spark plug for gas combustible engines, the lawnmower, the water hose. We are those great ones. And all throughout time, that we've been depending on us, on our people, to get us out of some of the messes that mankind has gotten itself into. You see it back in history, you see it in modern day time. We've got a new day coming. We've got to find out a way of how to take part in this new upbringing, in this new spirit, this new understanding of who we are. So I believe if we take four little words and we share them amongst the children and amongst ourselves, we'll be all right. We're going to be all right. It's ordained that things are going to work out. So I'll say these words and you say them back, right? No matter where we go. No matter where we go. There we are. There we are.
We're not just players. We're not, not just, just players. We're the shining stars. We're the, the shining stars. stars. Spread this word. Spread this word. Both near and far. Both, Both near and far. About just how blessed. About just, just how blessed. We truly are. We truly are. Take these words. Take, take these, these words. Across the land. Across, across the, the land. land. Divided we fall. Divided we fall. United we stand. United, United we stand. stand. Think about greatness. Think, think about greatness. Your history. Your history. Without my people. Without, without my people. people, without our people, without, without our people. people, without your people, without, without your, your people. people, where would we be? Where, where would, would we, we be? be? Amen. Ashe. Love it. Ashe. Hotep <laughs> Oba William King, Thank Justice so Arts. You did a wonderful tribute mm -hmm. to my very favorite person in the whole wide yes. world, my guest today. Dr. Margaret Taylor Goss Burroughs. I know all Thank the you, names. <laughs> I know them all. She was my high school art teacher at DuSable High School many, many years ago before she was the co-founder of the DuSable Museum. Museum. Mm -hmm. And before we go <laughs> into some history of all of that, we want Dr. Burroughs to read a poem that, that, of course, we want to emphasize for those who may not know that What Shall I Tell My Children Who Are Black was written February 18, 1963 by Dr. Margaret Taylor Goss Burroughs. Yes. So now that we have given credit where credit is due, then we will let our icon here read another of her poems. Dr. Burroughs? Well, as you said, as you said, uh, What Shall I Tell My Children Who Are Black was done in 1963. <coughs> And that poem was really the involvement of the DuSable Museum, which was the first black history museum in the country, indeed in the world. Now, you know, there are about 200 black history museums throughout the country. I'm very proud of that because many of them I've gone down and sat down with the people to tell them how to get it started without reinventing the wheel. So then in 2005, I wrote, uh, I had another question to ask, what will your legacy be? And this, you two people are leaving your legacy. You will be remembered. But I'd like to read part to this. Read the whole thing if you choose. Okay, well, if can, may I? Yes, you may. Legacy. Do you know what the word legacy means? Well, if you don't know, let me tell you what the dictionary says it means. Legacy. Property or money left to someone by a will. Something handed down from those who've gone before. Now, in this poem, I'm not, I'm not referring to material things like property or money. I'm referring to what you have done, what you are doing with this life that God has given to you. Yes, I want to know what will your legacy be? What will your legacy be when you have finally cast off these mortal coils, when you have crossed that great divide, when you can no longer run life's race, when you no longer have a place, when you, you have at last completed the circle round and when an escape is no longer to be found? What will your legacy be? Stop for a moment and listen to me and answer this question if you can. What will your legacy be? When you must cross that great divide into an area from which none can hide, when you, you alone, with no one by your side, with no friend to lead you or to hold your hand, what will your legacy be? What deeds will you have done in your lifetime which will be left for you to be remembered by? Will it be just a gray decaying tombstone standing alone in a cemetery? Or will it be as it should be, some act, some service, some deed that will ensure that you will be remembered on and into the eternity of life's game? So I ask you, what will your legacy be? Will it be the fact that you helped somebody along the way during the time while you were here on earth? Will it be similar to the legacies left to our generation by people like Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, John Brown, Ida B. Wells, Mary Bethune, Martin Luther King, and many others? who made of their lives a bridge for us to cross over on and whose lives were an inspiration for us of today to make our lives bridges for future generations to cross over on. So what will your legacy be? Legacy, legacy. We mentioned people like Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, Mary Bethune, Dr. Martin Luther, Jr. K Luther King Jr., Sojourner Truth, John Brown, Bessie Coleman, uh, Paul Robeson, his legacy was the fact that he was a Renaissance man. He was a concert, a folk singer, an athlete, and he fought for the liberation of all people. Poets like Margaret Walker, Langston Hughes, 
Their legacy were the inspirational points that they left about our people. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, his legacy was the fact that he early brought to the attention of the world the numerous and significant contributions of people of African and African descent. Booker T, his legacy was the fact that he worked for the education of our people when he founded and opened Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, George Washington Carver. His legacy was his significant and important accomplishments in the field of science. Jean Baptiste Point de Sable. His legacy was the fact that he, a black man, was the first person to settle in the area that became Chicago and grew into a great trading center from the little post that he started over 100 years ago. Last but not least, Charles Gordon Burroughs. His legacy was the first that the black was that the first black history museum in the world he was co-founder of started in his living room at 3806 South Michigan Avenue. And this act inspired many who were interested in the recognition and preservation of black history to the point that today there are over 200 black history museums in our country. Well, these are just a few, as you well know. There are many, many others who, who like these, left through their legacies, their contributions in their lifetime. They, are they will be remembered. So I ask you, what will your legacy be? Have you thought about it? Do you have an answer? What will you leave as your legacy? If you have no answer, if at this point you cannot say, well, listen to me because this is the moment, this is the prime moment for you to think and to get to work and to identify what you will leave as your legacy so that you will be remembered. You have time on your hands. You have time to begin even now to get busy, to do something, to help somebody, to improve conditions of life for people now and for those who come after. And to you may build institutions to educate and broaden the minds of our people. And for those who come after to make of your life a contribution that will be your legacy. Do this and your name will be remembered from now on and into eternity. And so you will be remembered, but it will not just be your name on a gray decaying tombstone. So think now, act now. Get busy to ensure that leg your legacy will be a positive contribution to humanity, and you will be remembered. You will be remembered on and on into eternity as God wills it. What will your legacy be? You guys have left, you're leaving your legacy. We know your legacy will be here. Dr. Burroughs, with all due respect, I, I really don't have a sense of leaving a legacy, but I do certainly recognize the le legacy that you continue you to leave. You are leaving a legacy by the work that you're doing. You're doing many things in the community and all, you're leaving a legacy. Well, if you say so, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> I say so. <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose I can't quarrel with that. I want to read the minutes from the December 20th, 1960 uh, meeting the following persons met at the borough studio at 3 p.m. and participated in an exploratory discussion regarding setting up a museum of Negro history in Chicago. C.G., who I presume is Charles Gordon Burroughs, mm -hmm. Lou, who I presume is Gerard Lou, right. M. Burroughs, who must be Margaret That's Taylor me. Burroughs, <laughs> uh, another C. Burroughs, E. Ford, I don't know who that Eugene is. Eugene Ford. Eugene was, uh, Ford. F. Ford. Is there an F. Ford? Felicia Ford. Felicia his Ford, wife. his mm -hmm. wife. W. Jones, who is Wilberforce, Wilberforce Jones. Jones. Mm -hmm. E. Feldman, who is Eugene. Eugene Feldman. P yes. And the group formed itself into an informal steering committee to look into the matter of a place and the collection of materials. By unanimous consent, the group agreed to meet again in a month for a report on the matter of the place. The meeting adjourned at 4 p.m., Margaret Burroughs, temporary secretary. <laughs> so good. at this point in your history, we find you in 1960 at a meeting being a secretary and uh, taking recording the minutes for the first meeting that led to the establishment of the DuSable Museum That's of right. African American History. That's it. From that, talk to us about the journey. Well, <laughs> it's been a long journey. It, and it, it, it's been a struggle in some well, ways. Well, because of the fact that it was something that helped somebody. Mm -hmm. We didn't do it just to make money or to get material things, but to help somebody. Mm -hmm. And so it grew and grew, and, and aid came from all different directions. People brought us objects for the museum. Uh, many people volunteered to be the lecturers in the museum. And it grew and grew and grew. And then also, as I began to uh, be called on, 
by other communities to come and tell them how to get started without having to reinvent the wheel, without having to try to build a building from the ground up. Mm -hmm. We start. We started right in the living room, right mm -hmm. where we were, mm -hmm. because Booker T. Had advised our people. He said, "If you want to do something, put down your buckets where you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> put down mm -hmm. your buckets where right you are." Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the foresight that you had, in fact, the the audacity to start a museum in a living room, to start a museum in a home, and to go from there, to begin there, to cast down your bucket That's where right, you where were, you and to see now that you are in the process of building another wing right. onto the museum. When will the ground, b ground be broken for that wing? Well, they're, they're in the process of uh, planning the capital campaign now. I think they got to raise about $6 million, which will be matched by $6 million from the state. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're planning that campaign now so that if you hear about it or you want to send in a check to the Salva Museum on the new building, do so. <laughs> all right, all right. And other things that I know personally that you have done is to co-found the Southside Community Arts Center. Was that before or after that the was, uh, Museum? That before was 41. That was 41. 20 years before. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and what was the impetus for that? Well, because way back in 1941, as artists, we didn't have any place to exhibit or to have classes. And that was when they had the WPA. And the, uh, the WPA was setting up <coughs> art centers in various parts of the country. So they chose the South Side for one. And <coughs> this was brought to our attention. And so many of us who were young artists got right around to, to buy that particular building to house this first, first art center that would be in Chicago. And I remember standing on the corner of 39th and Grand Boulevard. Which, which was then King Drive, which, which later, later became King Drive. Which South, later Parkway became first. South Parkway and then later became right. King Drive, uh -huh. collecting a mile of dimes because we had to raise <coughs> $12,000 to buy that building. Mm -hmm. So we got the money and we bought the building. <laughs> and then we, even when the WPA. In 41, you raised $12,000? We, yeah, we were able That was astronomical wow. then. Right. And so. Um, that then the, the WPA provided money for t for paying salaries of the teachers to do the classes and so forth and so on. But when the WPA went out of existence, because of the fact that we had bought the building, we were able to continue. Mm -hmm. Many of the projects that had started where they were renting, when the WPA f uh, faded out and they didn't have the money, they went out of existence. Mm -hmm. But we remain and we're still and you're operating today. I'm very proud of it. Absolutely. And having one classes. One and of my legacies. <laughs> okay. So mm -hmm. is one legacy sufficient or do we need to sprout a branch no, but, uh, of legacy? Everything that you do that helps somebody is a legacy that you'll right. be remembered. Okay. Now. And then, of course, you're a world traveler. I will be remembered more than just by a tombstone. Of I'll course. be remembered by the Poetry museum. Of course, of course, of <laughs> course. Traveling and we were in Minnesota doing a presentation and, uh, and the audience, uh, when we finished our program, a young man came up to me and, and said to me, he was one of the teachers at this African American Institute, he says, you're from Chicago, man, that's a great place. You know, I went to school in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Burroughs was one of my <laughs> teachers. Do you mm -hmm. remember her? Mm -hmm. And he's like the vice principal of an African-American centered uh, institution there mm -hmm. in Minnesota, which is another arm of your legacy. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. because, because of the way that you influenced him and set him on a path that he continued to work. And now he's influencing others. That's wonderful. So that continues your legacy, That's the wonderful. great things that wonderful. you do, that mm -hmm. you're remembered for. And it's not surprising that you wrote a, a, a poem to children and about children, because you have always shown that interest in young people. You've always inspired and encouraged them. And I bet you meet a lot of people, a lot of people who are now adults, such as myself, who are senior citizens, who can come and tell you where they met you and what you what your inspiration and what your influence has been on their lives. I remember Ramon Price because we Dear were Ramon. in high school together. Dear Ramon. Yes. And I know <laughs> that he became a very fine artist under your tutelage. Can you tell us some others that you n now see coming and going? Over oh, William King has to be one <laughs> of them. I, I really can't remember. You, I, well, Deborah <laughs> Han has sent her best wishes and salutations to you because she said you gave her her first show 
and she is now an accomplished artist and doing very well in the art world. And who is Deborah Han? Deborah Han is my daughter, oh, but she claims you as her mother. But <laughs> so. very, very talented young lady. Well, I always say that I'm her biological mother, <laughs> you're her cultural mother, and I <laughs> won't right. have any, we won't cut her in half. There no problem. Go. Right. Mm -hmm. But you have inspired and have encouraged and always offered to help anybody that seems to be going in the right direction. If they come near anywhere near you and tell you what they're trying to do, you will tell them to call you up and you will put them in touch with other people who might be helpful or uh, make, make suggestions to them. It's one of the wonderful things that well, Dr. Burroughs well, does. Well, Gloria, it's, it's a two-way street because if I do something to help them or inspire them, they're also strengthening me and making me stronger. Mm. Is that you know, right? It's a two-way street. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Like you young people helped to make me what I am today. Well, Understand? I'd, I'd, I'd <laughs> like to take some credit, but I don't think I'm entitled no, to you do can. it. All you right. Can. Well, mm -hmm. I tell you, the book that, that they did uh, that actually was supposed to be your autobiography, The, the Journey with Margaret. Life with Margaret. Life with mm -hmm. Margaret. Dr. Burroughs, I think that probably you, you know, you, we need an encyclopedia <laughs> because, you know, to try to Several have volumes. one, yeah, try to have one little book and try to actually say all, when I think of the people that I know that you knew, that you had associations with, like Wendelin Brooks, mm -hmm. uh, Congressman August, uh, Gus Savage, uh, Oscar Brown Jr. and his father, and, um, who was the who was the artist the the writer who died um, very early on very brilliant I'll, it'll come to me later but I remember that he he was living in a public housing uh, project Frank For, um, he was living and they put a snake in his mailbox because he integrated he integrated mm -hmm. an area where black people were not wanted at that time and they tried to drive him out of that area but he was the first one to gain some celebrity and that was not the the poet frank marshall davis no 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 not no him. but it will come to me i hope you're having a senior moment i'm i have <laughs> all have those all the time but i'm frank london brown frank is london who i'm brown, trying to yeah, say do you remember they put a, a snake in his mailbox very wonderful writer he who died way too, too soon. soon yes mm -hmm. But I can just remember I once came to a white writer's workshop because I wanted to become a writer. And I once came to a writer's workshop and there was so much talent in that room and you were either a part of it or conducting it. I don't know whether you were the person in charge, but you were major in that workshop. And I listened to people read their work, because that's what people did. Frank yeah. London Brown was one of right, them. Right. And I went home and decided that I was nowhere near being ready to, to, to be a writer, because I, th these people uh, just mesmerized me. I think that was a workshop, that, a series of workshops that we had at the Art Center. I'm sure South it was. The Southside Art Center. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, and, you know, writers were encouraged to come and bring their work and read, read them. and there were critiques. Mm -hmm. You know, there was uh, these conversations back and forth from their colleagues, from people That's who right. did what you did, and nobody was unkind. You Not know, everybody all. gave constructive criticism to improve the work that right. what and uh, was being considered. And that's a powerful model. And, and we use that model still today. And there's one organization that started, and this was maybe now 15 years ago, Black Screenwriters Association. And all of the writers, when we would gather together, and it would be on a Monday, and the actors that were available would come and read the work so that the writers could sit around and hear their words out mm -hmm. loud mm -hmm. and then we'd have a critique session and it was always in love it was mm -hmm. never meant to tear down or mm -hmm. to find mm -hmm. something wrong mm -hmm. with your work but to bolster up mm -hmm. and that was a model from dr burroughs mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. that improved the writing because once you were able to hear your work mm -hmm. then you can kind of hear you know where the story was going or how it was that you were presenting or, or what it would sound like to an audience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was great for mm -hmm. getting back uh, to the drawing board, uh, the rewrite and the revision, mm -hmm. the most important part mm -hmm. of writing. And then, of course, Dr. Burroughs, you were always on the right side of social issues. Mm -hmm. Always, always fighting, so. yeah. <laughs> always fighting for equal rights for our people. Because, you know, these days, I don't think our people think much about what may have happened before 
when we were so segregated and so discriminated against and so restricted mm -hmm. in where we could live, where we could go to school, what we could aspire to be. You know, you couldn't, you'd have, all your dreams were deferred. Mm -hmm. you, you couldn't really have big dreams. And so t to have somebody who was out there on the line, and I, I, I just don't know how you dodged the bullets that had to be coming <laughs> all the time because you were very vocal in no. in your in your stands when you took when you decided to support something as you certainly did Paul Robeson mm -hmm. who I think you must love more than about anything else a very inspirational person to me mm -hmm. <coughs> what did you what you met Paul Robeson oh yes I was a, I was about 17 years old when I met him okay and in, it influenced me it's influenced my whole life, mm -hmm. me meeting that man. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot of Paul Robeson because I was fortunate enough to go to schools where I had teachers who always kept me involved with Negro history, as it mm -hmm. was called at mm -hmm. that time, who made me go to the Hall Branch Library, good, good. to Charlie May <laughs> Rollins, good. and read all those biographies that somebody, and it may have been her, we had one page, we had files with one, one or two pages with the biography of a, a particular person, and we had to give reports. Every Friday, we'd have to give a report and have to know it, not just come and read the report, but have to know the contents of the report. And so we began to feel as though we knew these people who mm -hmm. were remote Absolutely. in our history, <laughs> but we began to feel as though we knew these people and we were proud, you know, to, we were proud yes. to be yeah. Negroes, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. you know, and if someone hadn't put that foundation under us, then we would not have wanted to support a Negro History Museum because we had been taught to be ashamed right. of, of our blackness. And it was, a, it was a wonderful thing, the line in your poem in which you say, our children must survive for all mankind. And look at what we have now. Yes. We have one of our children who has survived, survived. for, <laughs> all, survived for all mankind. Oh, that's and it's, it's, did you think that you, it would come to this, Dr. Bros? Nope. Mm -hmm. You didn't think so. Too, too busy working. Yeah, too, it's <laughs> working. You're too busy working than to be thinking about nah. it. <laughs> right. It's the main thing. Yes. Well, what are your plans for your travels? I, where were you recently? You told me. Well, you've been to tell you the truth, yet there are over 50 African countries, and my goal is to visit every single one of the African countries. I want you to know I've done 25. Hey. So I have 25 <laughs> to go. So I have no time to die, mm -hmm. or to get sick or to get broke or anything like that, because I have to reach my goal. Mm. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> you, where were you re most recently? Wh I was in, uh, let's say, I was in Vietnam. That was not Africa, but in, uh, it was Vietnam. And a uh, little time before that, I was in um, uh, South Africa and Tanzania mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about three or four months ago. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm trying to spend my pension money on me. <laughs> so, so every time I have direct deposits, so every time I go to the bank and I see how much I got, I say, oh, I got to take a trip somewhere. And I call Eleanor Chapman of the African Travel Advisor. Mm -hmm. said, what you got going? Said, About three, four thousand dollars. She said, well, it's going here, going there. I said, book me in. Because mm -hmm. okay. I intend to die broke. Yeah, we go. I intend to leave one check, it'll mount. <laughs> <laughs> But I intend to spend that pension money on me while I can enjoy it. Well, there I think you, you should. You know, <laughs> I used to have a fear of flying. In fact, I told my daughter that what I actually had was a fear of not flying. I wanted the plane to stay in the air once it <laughs> got up there, not, 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 not fly. But the point was that when you said that you were going to Africa, and it was somewhere around the time when I decided that if you were on that airplane, it would stay in the air. Now, that's <laughs> what I said to myself. I really did. And so there was this trip go going to Senegal. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I joined you along with some other friends. And we all went over to Senegal. And mm -hmm. it was the most wonderful. I, I, was, I was not afraid at all because you were on the plane. Mm. And so we went to Senegal. We had a very, very interesting experience because there was a blackout while we were there. 
and we saw right. that African people are far more civil than most other people because there was no pillaging, there was no disruption, mm -hmm. nobody took advantage of the fact that you couldn't see at night. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they weren't uh, vandalizing stores and, and, and cars and what have you. They went on about their affairs in the same way that they did when, when they had lights. Of course, mm -hmm. they had, had gone on strike because the medical doctors had not been paid, and so they, they, they had a socialist mm, a um, a, a system. So the doctors had not been paid, and so the doctors went on strike, and the electrical workers went on strike in support of the doctors, which was the reason why, the reason for the blackout. It didn't last very long, a few days. Mm -hmm. But the point was that we saw that African people, this could not have happened in an urban uh, city in this, in this country. It could, simply could not have happened. Downtown would have been plundered and it would have just been a wreck the next morning. So we, but we traveled to Africa, we traveled there and back together and I felt I have not been afraid of flying since. Oh good. I've, <laughs> even without Dr. Burroughs on the plane. Well you know you stand more of a chance of getting hit, hit on the head with a drive-by shooting than getting killed in an airplane. Mm -hmm. I think that every African American person, every person of African descent should take at least one trip home. Mm -hmm. at least. One trip home. Mm -hmm. Instead of going to some other place for vacation or all, mm -hmm. take one trip home, even if it's just one weekend mm -hmm. or one week. And they'll be surprised what it does for them. They will be energized. They will, it will they'll, they'll be kept younger, yeah. made mm -hmm. younger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, after all, see people that can't believe it, Mm -hmm. How old I am, mm -hmm. about three times thirty, but that comes from going home mm -hmm. and getting energized. Mm -hmm. You know, every so often I go home and get energized. You know, because mm -hmm. people in Africa, many people in Africa, somebody would be, they might be actually sixty years old and they look forty, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and that's because they're not all tied up running after that dollar and all mm -hmm. these things up. that we get mm -hmm. uh, involved in over mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that everybody, anybody listening, take one trip home. Mm -hmm. Take one, at least one trip home. And I can testify to that because when we got to the, when the plane landed mm. in the car and I put my foot on the tarmac, mm. there was an enormous lifting. There, <laughs> uh, there was some sort of burden that I must have been carrying uh, without knowing it. Yeah, <laughs> but all mm -hmm. of a sudden I felt free and <laughs> unshackled. Mm -hmm. And I felt that way throughout the whole time I was there. And when I came back, as we descended and came into the airport, I began to feel oh. cloistered <laughs> it again. It came back again. Right, right. it came when back we, again. When we went to uh, Benin, and, and the purpose or the joy of going to Benin is that the name Oba comes from Benin. And I received the name Oba here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And when I arrived in Benin in the city of, of Cotonou, and when the Africans that were there that met us at the airport, it was like a welcoming home. Mm -hmm. And as people look at you, and one of, one of the customs is, I must see you before mm -hmm. I speak to you. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the customs to see a person. So it was like looking and connecting with people in their eyes and then the greeting of fellow. Mm -hmm. And once you receive that greeting, you just felt like, oh, what power. <laughs> mm -hmm. We immediately the next day, you notice the green of the shrubs and the trees and the bush that, mm -hmm. that was there, the sky, the blueness of the sky, the clarity of the clouds. You, you can feel that the earth was vibrant. In the song, I Love My People, we'd been to a certain point, we were exchanging it like, uh, like a poem and, mm -hmm. and had a little rhythm and beat behind it, but it wasn't complete. I knew it wasn't complete yet. But when I returned from Africa, while we were traveling in, into a village called Apalidajo, and we're traveling in this red clay, like the red clay of Georgia, and these roads are very long and very steep hills going into the deep brush. And as you see along the way, the people working everywhere were working, either carrying their goods, their plants, their fruit. You, you saw them on these motorbikes just moving about, carrying large objects, and you saw people building and building and, and construction. And everywhere you look, people were working. And I, the line came into my head, you find my people all around the world, man and woman, boy and girl, always trying to do our best, work hard every day and seldom rest. And the one thing you can see was everywhere you looked, we were trying to do 
better for our condition for us right here. At least do better for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of spreads out. And so when I returned, and I told Maggie Brown and her sister Africa, and we gathered the children together and went in the studio to record that song because it was ready now. Mm -hmm. it. We saw it. Mm -hmm. We could see it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the power of going home and going to Absolutely. Africa, of, of, of seeing yourself. Dr. Boris, here's another reason to go home, to find out that you actually can live without all of the material supports that you think you have to <laughs> have. Because we're talking about an economy that seems to be in very serious trouble. <laughs> and we're talking about a, a, a period coming up that, that is unimaginable. And, and everyone that you hear says that they have never seen anything like it. And so they don't really know what to expect from moment to moment which sends shivers up the spines of everybody from Wall Street to Main Street mm -hmm. to, the, you know, the back alleys. The point is, when you go, as I went to Ghana, when you go, you find that people manage to live, that they live, they are sheltered, mm -hmm. they eat, they wear clothes, they go to bed, mm -hmm. They live their lives. I saw nothing family unity. looking the like stress. Thing was like the you bond said, people bustling, people enterprising. Mm -hmm. You know, it, they made in Ghana where we were, everything was being made. Everything that was being consumed was being manufactured. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So whatever it was that you needed, you could go right out on the thoroughfare and mm -hmm. find it. So that, you know, we have, we have got to become what Carter G. Woodson called accustomed to making a living, not mm -hmm. getting a job, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but making a living because Africans make, make a, a living, living and they make it every day. Yes. And, the, and, and, and don't look beaten down by the circumstances, the weather. Th for me, the sun was sometimes oppressive. It was just so <laughs> hot <laughs> during the, and I went out during the day because the mosquitoes were very busy at night. <laughs> and so I wanted to be out before all the mosquitoes got out so I could, you know, feel free to travel everywhere I wanted to go. Yeah. But I'm saying that we need to learn, we need to see ourselves as survivors, yeah. as people who can thrive no matter what some economy is doing. Right. And we need to go home and see the example. Absolutely. We mm -hmm. don't have it here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All we see here is homeless people, jobless people are homeless people. Mm -hmm. In Africa, we see people don't have jobs. Well, it's, it's not The unemployment a job. rate was 70%. In Dakar, when we were there, Dr. Burroughs, that's what one of the people there told me. Mm. So if you got a 70% unemployment rate and yet you don't have people plundering stores when you have a total blackout for three days for three nights in a row that tells you that people are not desperate they are not cannibalizing each other because they know how to live together mm -hmm. so I think you're right Dr. Burroughs when you're going I'm going with you <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know Anyhow. okay well if you go to Ghana please tell me because you call I have Eleanor, to go you call Eleanor Chapman okay at uh, you know, Africa advisors. Af African travel advisors. advisors. Okay. And, and tell her that I want to know. Find that number in the phone book. Right. And tell her to send you the next uh, flyer on to Ghana. The next trips coming up. Right. Right. Well, <coughs> I'm, I'm mainly <coughs> interested in going to Ghana at this moment because I just found out that's where I came from in the that's first right, place. That's right. That's where <laughs> all of our <coughs> African Americans came from Ghana. Is our ancestors right? were Ghana. Yeah. Ghanaian. <coughs> okay. Mm -hmm. From Ghana. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Where are you from Ghana too, Dr. Burroughs? Oh, I'm African American, ain't I? Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> all right. We all are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you get a name? Oh, I, I believe sometime back they gave me a name. Okay. Later, but well, I've they give you they gave me my name based upon the day of the week mm -hmm. that you're born what on. What name That's was they giving you? They gave me Afia. Afia. Yes. Now while I was there as a storyteller I was presenting and I had one um fawn speaking African who was the translator spoke seven languages and brilliant a beautiful rhythm and lilt to his mm -hmm. English language mm -hmm. and he says well I will go with Oba and so wherever we went he traveled with me mm -hmm. and uh, we were 
doing the presentation of the creation, the James Walton Johnson's creation. Mm -hmm. And as we were speaking to a group of people, I, I would say in rhythm, and God stepped down on space. And his interpretation to the foreign, in the foreign language mm -hmm. was just so beautifully mm -hmm. moving. Mm -hmm. And the, the heads in the audience, they would move back and forth between myself and him. Mm -hmm. The rhythm was so great. A at the end, it says, and and God, uh, and he blew into the breath of life, mm -hmm. and man and became, became a living, living soul. Amen. Amen. And I said, Amen. Amen. And then the repeat was, Amen. And then in the audience, Amen. And then I said again, Amen, Amen, Amen. And it was just became the call. Okay. Everywhere we went throughout the villages, in Dakota Village, in, uh, like I said, Apollodal, Sejay Village. And in Sejay Village, by the time we arrived in Sejay, it had traveled about when they'd see our vehicles going coming over the hill mm -hmm. you can hear throughout the the, the area mm -hmm. amen, mm -hmm. amen. Mm -hmm. and then when we'd meet there in the center of the village area where they had taken wood and the way that they've made the shelters where they take every piece of the wood and just split and then mm -hmm. they tie and the boards and the wood was so solid and the benches were made out of other pieces of the wood mm -hmm. and shaved and carved mm -hmm. to, to form the sitting places very resilient people, very mm -hmm. uh, uh, people that were very creative, and mm -hmm. everything was used. Mm -hmm. And as we'd make it there, the area was full. And on the last trip, they gave me uh, the name Mao Filene, and they introduced me to speak. And so I'm going to do another very brief story. And we were all prepared, and in the back they said, Mao feeling me. I'm like, y'all feeling me? <laughs> like, y'all feeling me. I said, y'all feeling me. And I'm thinking, you know, like the poets, you know, y'all feeling me. But they was like, my old feeling me. Uh -huh. I mean, God remembers you. When uh, we were speaking, and one of the things we found in every place that we would go is to look so deeply in the eyes of the people, the, the depth of the beauty of the blackness of our skin would just lead you into the eyes. Mm -hmm. And the thing I remember was that the eyes are the window to the soul. And you would just see deep into our brothers and sisters. And when I, I took pictures to bring them back so that the children here could see. And you see little pictures. It was like Pookie and Ray Ray and all of them. <laughs> yes. You know, and we, yes. we show the pictures yes. back yes. and forth. The kids in the classrooms, they yes. see themselves. Th themselves. Mm -hmm. And they see how beautiful we mm -hmm. are. And it takes that image of the, off of the television. And they say, wow. And, and, and it's not the little fly flying on the lip mm -hmm. or the poked bellies. You right, see right. human beings. You see mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. You see Who are not folk. suffering. The whole face mm -hmm. of Africa <coughs> is not it's the not face suffering. of suffering. It's not mm -hmm. suffering. Right. And it's wonderful it's to see your relatives people. because you're standing in the airport and you see your grandson yeah. over there. Yeah, you yeah. see your cousin yeah. over there. Yeah. Because you see the people who look like you. Yeah, you know, and yes. who look like they belong yeah. in your immediate family, mm -hmm. not just somebody not who resembles your resemble, community. No. Well, Dr. Burroughs, I thank you for the legacies that you continue to leave because you have never, you have never stopped. And I don't know where you get this energy from. You know, when you, <laughs> I, I looked at your <laughs> card and it said all these yes, things. God. Dr. Burroughs is a, available for doing about 50 things. Yeah. You give lectures. You well, that's poetry, because people you like you encourage me. People like this young man, they encourage me. You all keep me going. You understand? Well, I think you're going to go whether <laughs> we do it anything or not. I think you, you have tireless energy and you are still working. You're still well, not. Uh, well, I'm still alive, park, aren't I? Yeah. Well, you're still a park district commissioner. Well, yeah. I'm just trying to do something to help. Well, I, we're glad <laughs> that you're doing something to help us. Heaven help us if we had some of these other people who had some other ideas. But I'm glad that you want to see that everybody's treated fairly, that democracy really does work for all people and not just for the few who have, have uh, been able to get positions of power. Well, as I said, I don't have any time to die. Well, uh, we don't want you to have no, any time no. to die. Too much, much work to do. Too much work to do. <laughs> well, you know, I think before I close this show, though, I do need to stop and just say this. When you talk about leaving your legacy, we just lost Morgan Carter, yes, someone Dr. we call Carter. the conversation yes. starter. He left That's his right. legacy. And he, left he, his he legacy. certainly left his legacy, and he left his beautiful wife, Wanda, to carry on that legacy. She was his helpmeet. She was his partner beautiful in all of his enterprises. They were very, very 
active and, and beautiful people. So we very want, want to just uh, very open. Just send out our condolences to the family of Morgan Carter, the conversation starter. And I just think that he's probably up there starting a conversation yes, right. between sure. all of the powers. <laughs> he he had to run on up there plane. and talk about Barack Obama. <laughs> right. <laughs> he right. singing the song, Barack right. Obama is president. Dr. <laughs> Burroughs, if you had a bucket list or a wish list, what things would you like to see? I know that you, you know, the bucket list comes from a movie where these men said that they needed, before they kicked the bucket, they needed, there were certain things that they wanted to have done, and they, the, the things they wanted to do were adventuresome, like hang gliding and, you know, other Race foolishness. Race car driving. But and, yeah. I'm saying, if you had uh, a wish list, of things that you would like to see done, not necessarily do them yourself, you've done enough, but things that you would like to see done, maybe in education in the schools, maybe in politics, maybe in, I don't know, wherever your interests are. What, mm. what kinds of things would you, would you like to see Mandela and, and Obama take a picture together? <laughs> What kinds of things would, would you would you like to see happen in, in, in this? Uh, oh, I would just like for the people to continue supporting the Zabo Museum so it grows and that we continue to promote black history and knowledge of our contributions in our school system and so forth. Okay. That's what I'd like and to And you see. want them to support the Southside Community Arts Center? And the Arts Center, Center yes. Right. To su su support our black institutions. Okay. Mm -hmm. you know. We have too few okay. institutions. We have a lot of programs. We have a lot of, um, of all kinds of uh, fledgling things, things that you know come into being and then disappear because they don't have institutions. You knew that what you were doing with that museum needed a place. You knew. I would like to see our black churches support institutions like the Salvo Museum and the yeah. Southside Community Arts Center and any of our cultural institutions that the black churches should support them because. Here, uh, all these years, there's only about two churches, two black churches that have given any real support to the Sabo Museum. How does a and church all support these other churches? A, how, how would a church do that? Give them some money, some money, some no. money, some okay, money. Okay, you mean the church would take from its... That's right. Its, they uh, collect that money every Sunday, give some to the museum and to the art center to keep them going. Okay. That's what I think. And individual members, of course, can always Absolutely. do that if, if their church... Well, the other thing is individual members can all, all also petition their churches to support. Why is it that we never ask our churches to tithe back? You know, yeah. they, they talk about tithing to the church, I think, but mm -hmm. to what does the church I think the, the idea of tithing tithe? back to the community. Yeah. But so I think they tithe concept. out on, I think they go out, the missionaries, go outside of the community. They, in fact, they usually, missionaries usually seek to go somewhere out of the country <laughs> mm -hmm. and do the missionary they work the as though there's right no work <laughs> casting down your bucket again. Cast right down now. your buckets yeah, where you are. Right. right here. Put down your buckets where you are. Right. Mm -hmm. But memberships, I mean, one of the s simplest things that people can do to you help the DuSable Museum become a member. Become a member. Mm -hmm. and, the art center. And, and just that, and the art center. Mm -hmm. And then by being a member and you get the information about certain events that mm -hmm. happen, show up. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a Founders Day celebration. I love all of the activities that we do at the DuSable Museum, but when you have like a Founders Day celebration and you're acknowledging the greatness of all of this wealth of history and knowledge that are held, held in that building, but you look into the audience and it's only two or three quarters full, then you feel like, where are we? Why aren't we mm -hmm. here? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we can do is increase our membership, and then as a member, you want to take advantage mm -hmm. of the benefits. Mm -hmm. right. So then, and perhaps uh, maybe some churches say, well, we, you know, we're struggling to, to pay our land mass uh, or mm -hmm. rent our taxes and that kind of thing. Then maybe you can put in your announcement mm -hmm. on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Don't forget to visit the DuSable Museum. Or you can or take the, the Art children. Center. Bring the, the children, children. Churches the, have Sunday bring the children. Schools, bring you know? the children. Yes, yes, Take yes. the children That's on cool. excursions so mm -hmm. that they, and don't ever think, and I think most people do think, if you took your children to the DuSable Museum, mm -hmm. then they've been to the DuSable Museum. No, is you that couldn't that? No, no, possibly no. consume <laughs> everything yeah. in any museum, That's and especially right. not the DuSable Museum. Right. 
in any one visit. Mm -hmm. There needs the, you need to have frequent visits. Well, and, and they work on curriculum absolutely. and developing mm -hmm. tours so that you can go mm -hmm. and see it, a particular exhibit. Mm -hmm. And, and they're changing exhibits. Tra exhibits constantly change changing mm -hmm. exhibits. The, and the Black Farmer is a new, and I'm writing script for the Black Farmer exhibit mm -hmm. that's upcoming. And, mm -hmm. and then we're entering in the Kwanzaa season, mm -hmm. and this is an important period with those seven principles. And once we kind of get into the se this season, people begin to remember again, oh, yeah, uh, a unity, a self-determination, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a collective work of responsibility. Creativity. Yeah, yeah. The, the purpose. Collective right, yeah. work And then we start to remember it again. But mm -hmm. those are seven principles to guide us throughout our the life. year, throughout a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we just stay strong to what and who we are. Mm -hmm. We are Absolute. cultural, powerful, Absolute. creative, wonderful people. Well, we Absolute. have to we have to have more people singing, I love my people. I love my and, people. And because truly you love, and love is, a, right. love is an action word. Right. Love is not just, I love my people. You don't just chill and love you. <laughs> You've got to go and demonstrate <laughs> love. Mm -hmm. Demonstrate love. Mm -hmm. Show folk that you love you. Mm -hmm. The way you carry yourselves. Mm -hmm. The way that we... The way that we respect our elders when we're in in person with them, mm -hmm. and I was talking to some young cats the other day about how we change the tone when we're outside, just standing on the block, yelling and rapping at each other. That's mm -hmm. one language. That's mm -hmm. cool. We understand that. Mm -hmm. We walk into a room or get on a bus or we we cross paths with elders, mm -hmm. we cross paths with women. Our language must Shut change. It down. That's showing that we love mm -hmm. our people. Mm -hmm. And you, it's starting to demonstrate. We mm -hmm. had a little uh, rap we were doing with some kids and. And one of the kids said, uh, we said, what are you going to do because of this change? Now that Barack, he's been elected, what are you going to do? Barack Obama is president. How are you going to change things? Well, I'm going to sit in front of my class today because Barack Obama is president. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to listen to what my teacher says because mm -hmm. Barack Obama is president. Mm -hmm. One boy said, I'm going to pull up my pants and wear a belt. Because Barack Obama is president. <laughs> that's wonderful. I said, with, with that, that's your start. Uh -huh. And if you're inspired uh -huh. to do that because of that, that's mm -hmm. your beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, where is that going to take you next? Mm -hmm. Now that someone sees you dressed mm -hmm. appropriately, they, appropriately, they may call you in to speak to you about the next step. And the I next remember step. when Harold Washington was elected mayor, my girlfriend and I got up and we got dressed up. Dressed we said, up. we the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> we the mayor. We had to go out and have lunch because we yes. were the mayor. Yes. And we went, and it seemed that the lights stayed green longer. Yeah. <laughs> there didn't have any red lights stopping us. But the whole point is you have to understand that we're the president now. And so when you're the president, you don't wear your pants below no, your hips. No, you, you got to understand hips, that everything, you know, that, you know, it's always what you do is a reflection of those who look like you. Mm -hmm. And so that is one of the ways that, you know, you get to easily break mm -hmm. us down if we're not all standing mm -hmm. on solid ground. We've got to do our best. Well, we got a we got a major leg legacy right here sitting yes, we do. here in our midst. And Dr. Burroughs, I just don't know. What inspired you in the first place? I don't know who you got your inspiration from, but whoever it from was. From people like you. I wasn't there at the That's beginning. That's not you were there. I was there at the beginning. Okay. Well, all I got to say, spirit. all I got to say <laughs> is that I'm glad Paul Robeson inspired you. I know that's one of them. And I'm very happy that you are still with us and don't have time to die. And I don't have time <laughs> to go either because I got to see what else you're going to do. <laughs> I ain't got no time to die. I ain't got no time that's to die. That's a poem, right? That's, that's a story. Right, that's right. a poem. So that's a song. I ain't got no time to die. I sound like I a novel for me. <laughs> well, there may be a collaboration on your way so out. You can write me. Yeah, uh, yes, I will. <laughs> okay. Yes, I will. I want to thank, thank you, you so Oba much. William King and Dr. Margaret Taylor Goss Burroughs. I thank you so much for being my guest today. We and want to thank you for inviting us. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad it's that you consented street. to come. <laughs> I know this how is, busy you, you are. This is a blessing for me thank to you. sit in your company. And you really have to take, no, you can't take a look. You need to ask somebody because you are leaving a fantastic <laughs> legacy. <laughs> and right. I got a phone call and somebody said, oh, you're going to Dr. Gloria Peace today. Can I just, can, you, can I go? Can you just pick me up a ride? Because she's influenced me in my life. You have some people that you've influenced out there as much as the next person. And I know you've been a humble soul and, and, a, and a kind spirit, but I think it helps you to pull up a little bit more. You've got to change the way you talk to people.